When the twilight is gone ah. And no songbirds are singing ah. When the twilight is gone ah. You come into my heart Hey there, boils and ghouls. Welcome to another episode of Hollow Weekly. Nick Rollins here with... Georgie Lee. And today, today's a little bit of a sad day because they're skipping this week for Twin Peaks. Yes. And we wanted to do this episode to give everyone a little bit of their Twin Peaks fix. Including me. <laughs> including, yeah, including George. George right. fucking loves this show yep. more than he loves air. Yep. And so we wanted, we wanted to be a little... Um, I don't know a little a little a little shot of Twin Peaks for you to to hold you over till next week comes back. Next week comes back. Next week, there you go. You just got to make it through this weekend. It's Fourth I just of July caught weekend. my um, first uh, downfall Hitler Twin Peaks meme about skipping this week, and yeah. it was hilarious. <laughs> it was so good. <laughs> Where do you think? Well, for, okay, first off, because we mainly want to talk about. The, the last episode, the seven and eight, episodes seven and eight, right? Yeah, well, honestly, being the kind of podcast we are, what we really want to do is we want to talk about how Twin Peaks just re-entered the horror conversation, particularly with the last episode. Yeah. Because it scared the shit out of a lot of people. <laughs> but so, but just, just, just real quick, because we haven't done, we did Firewalk With Me. Yes. And that was to prep me for the new series. Yes. Which I'm liking. How, how do you like it so far? The new series? The new series. It's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. You're not upset at anything. You think it's working out just fine. I'm upset it's not on this week. Um, well, that's why we're here. <laughs> that's... No, no, no. I mean, nothing's perfect. But I, I um, as you'll discover, I, I have a whole list of reasons why I think that it's um, trying something that we probably will never see again in the history of television, at least uh, while I'm alive. Wow. Even with Netflix and all these people, even, every, Net- even when people are making their doesn't matter. This is a totally unique uh, set of circumstances. I do have one thing I want to look up real quick: Twin Peaks, The Return. Mm-hmm. I got because the the only thing I want to talk about that I that that well wait let's me up. let's set the stage first before you so the you just watched episode eight. I watched it. Literally I watched like it. Last night. I watched it yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had no spoilers going in. You were. Not, no. not that you could spoil this, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could you could try as, as hard as you want, but I'd be you'd have the hardest goddamn time, right, uh, in the world. Um, uh, I'm just trying to so so I skimmed through five and six, yes, because I just because I because you're the Twin Peaks expert, mm. so I went to you. I was like, do I need? Because I I did some traveling, went back home, and you were like, you don't need to. It's not that important. Oh, you need to, but not for this episode. But not for right. not not for seven. Because we're talking about Twin Peaks and horror, and eight is the main focus. Yeah. So I so so I so I watched those two, and the one the one thing I wanted to point out about episode seven is I'm a sucker for the song from Santo and Johnny Sleepwalk, mm-hmm. and when they played at the end of episode seven in the diner, amazing. I was like, ah. Oh. Episode seven and eight have closed on some of the best use of music I've ever seen on television. Just amazing. It was so good. And you told me a little bit about the diner scene, how every time the camera flips, people are in a different position. Yeah, it's, it's got the different angles and people are out of position or in positions where they weren't in the shot before. And the music was also yeah, kind of jacked because they uh, they put underneath some sinister Twin Peaks music under a sleepwalk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I noticed that there was like a like a like a low rumble, like it was almost like crisscrossing, like mm-hmm. as Sleepwalk was fading, this song mm-hmm. sort of or like that rumbly like scary noise, absolutely went through. Absolutely. It was so perfect. I'm a sucker for that because even um, Preacher mm-hmm. uses some music like that every now and then. And every True. time they do, it's like super effective. Like totally. I, just, I love the the the, the, vibe. the thing is other shows usually show their hand. They're not really good poker players. Like mm-hmm. when they do that with the music. It's matching the fact that the scene has something dramatic going on in it. Yes. This was a scene of people getting served coffee and pie. So you and the credits rolling. And so you're not really expecting anything to be happening, but with Lynch it, it there's always something happening. I was so so what did happen in the diner? Because you said something was going on. Nobody knows. I mean, nobody can tell you what's happening in any of this show, really. That's part of what we're gonna talk about. But you know the the what was obvious was 
that there something is in the process of changing. And I think that's why the character of Shelly in that scene kind of looked surprised for a second, like taken back. Like she didn't know what was happening and then she shook it off and moved on. Like, because it's not obvious yet, but something's happening. <laughs> right. Gotcha. Right. So that leads into episode eight. I'm trying so. to look up the song. There's a, there's a few, there was one, um, well, they play the platters. Oh, there it is. So I, I we're going to jump around seven and eight for, for, right. for this one, totally. but just to, we got to jump into eight. Cause that's the, that's mm-hmm. the, that's the meat and potatoes of what fucked everyone up this yes, week. Totally. I got sucked into it like immediately, especially during the, like the nuclear explosion. But the thing that fucked me up was, uh, the song, uh, or the, the, the piece from the Warsaw National Philharmonic, uh, the victims of Hiroshima. The Threnody for you. Yeah. Oh my. And that's been used before. I think it was used by Scorsese once and there's other people who have used it, but it was so effective. Like, oh my God. This like, like, it, I, whenever there's articles of like, this this episode's the scariest episode of television of all time. Sure. I'm always like, I, I it never is. Nothing's right. ever the scariest. Nope. You know, it because a lot of it I think factors into like where you are mentally Your watching it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And I was watching this while Alex and some friends were out on the patio, and Alex kept messaging me, "Can you bring me out this?" And it would pause. But like, and I, I would be like, oh, oh man, I'm trying, I'm trying to get into this. I'm trying to get into this. Mm-hmm. And then I'd sit back down and hit play and the music kept going. I was like, oh, I'm, instantly, <laughs> I'm instantly back into it. Like, it's just so unsettling. Like it's, I wouldn't say scary. Cause whenever you say scary, people expect to that be part scary. wasn't scary. It's just it, it, super it was ominous. And, yeah. Yeah. And unsettling, but that's part wasn't scary. I'm going to look, I'm going to jump back and forth here, but I'm going to start with a list of things that make me think of the horror genre. And yeah. then I'm going to go back and apply them to Twin Peaks okay. in a row, right? So, nightmares, mm-hmm. scary sounds, disorientation, yep, giving zero fucks, mm-hmm. being cutting edge, yep, right? These are, these are all things that remind me of the horror genre, right? Mm. So, the, the one that starts to me, the, the one that's most important to me is the giving zero fucks thing, okay? Mm-hmm. The, the, the people in the horror genre, the people like John Carpenter they should give zero fucks and they do (laughs) right. The horror genre literally is cutting edge because a lot of times it doesn't care if it's going to unsettle you or cross a line or scare you or go too far or whatever. Right. I'm telling you right now, unqualified opinion. (laughs) David Lynch gives less fucks than anyone who's ever worked in American television. Full full stop. I'll agree. There's just no, the only thing that I could think of that can't, that comes as close to him in terms of that is Rod Serling. But Rod Serling didn't give zero fucks, and he wasn't a director, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that also makes me think of the horror genre is intelligence. The people who work in horror genre, the really successful ones, the William Friedkins, the Steven Spielbergs, the Alfred Hitchcocks, the Val Lutons, these people are, Wes Craven, these people are ferociously smart people, right? Mm -hmm. But then when they go to the TV genre, they whiff all the time. So uh, Alfred Hitchcock Presents is a watered-down version of Twilight Zone. Amazing Stories is a watered-down version of Twilight Zone mixed with nostalgia for, you know, some mm-hmm. eras or, like, whatever. When you give super talented film directors a chance to do horror on TV, for some reason, they don't try to do what they do in movies, right? A lot of times, they're not even directing. Like, Hitchcock and Spielberg weren't directing, like, these episodes in the, for the most part. So, um, for some reason, you give major, major film directors a chance to work in television and they vanilla it up. And I'm not sure why. Yeah. I've been seeing a lot of reviews of episode eight where people are like, Oh my God, it's like Mulholland drive. Oh my God. It's like a racer head. You know, <laughs> you know why? Because they gave David Lynch the chance to work on major American television and he's acting like a film director. Yeah. He's, he's not that was one of the comments. I right. Saw. He's not whiffing. He's like, you know, I mean, it's a miracle that he got this chance. No one will ever get this chance again for an 18-hour presentation of, of you know what he, the kind of thing that he does, and he gives zero fucks. He's gonna go for it. He's gonna pursue his vision. He's not gonna care what the audience thinks. You can love it. You can hate it. You can find it boring. You can like whatever. You can be like it's not like the old Twin Peaks, or whatever. But 
I, you know, one of the things that I think the horror genre needs is giving zero fucks. And this guy is blazing the zero fuck trail like nobody yeah. I've ever seen on TV, right? So that's just like the first thing that I think of when I think of not I'm not I'm not even arguing that you have to enjoy what he's doing or necessarily that's even good from that argument. I think it is, but that's not the argument is just by way of leading by example. Yeah. This is a guy who's doing what the horror genre should do when it gets the chance to do something on TV. <laughs> that's what I thought while watching it. At least that episode eight, I was like, I've never seen this type of shit before. Because the only other David Lynch I had seen was was Firewalk with me and then the audio book of his uh, Catching the Big Fish. So that was the only, up until the recent Twin Peaks stuff, that's the only David Lynch I had seen. So sure. I, I wasn't familiar with like Eraserhead or Mulholland Drive. Mm-hmm. So while I was watching this, like that was my first like, fucking like crazy shit i've never seen before and i was like sucked what, the into showtime it. executive called it uh pure heroin lynch that's what i mean i don't know what heroin feels like but if that's what it feels like i don't know you know please keep that away <laughs> right but give it to me on the screen right exactly and and the second thing that i was talking about was scary sounds and i want you to talk about it a little bit because you're such a good video editor and and um, I'm fully convinced that the, uh, Twin Peaks is the scariest sounding thing that's ever been on television. Yeah, especially... The sound um, design is crazy good. Well, I liked how the music was kind of tied up with like the... Uh, like when they went... When the camera kind of goes inside the um, the explosion. Mm-hmm. Like there was like many explosions within the explosion. The music was sort of timed and, and sung up to that, which is really fucking cool. Totally. Um, but in particular, the... Um, Anytime, what do you call, what what are those guys called? The people who look like they're the woodsmen. The woodsmen is that mm-hmm. what they're called? They mm-hmm. look like they're covered in oil or whatever. Mm-hmm. Whenever those guys came out, they always made like that, like it changed the audio in like the real world, mm-hmm. which happened twice. Mm-hmm. So when the guy shoots Dark Cooper, mm-hmm. um, and then they come out, like it gets that like that muffled kind of noise, but then his audio is either muffled or pitched differently. Yes, and then it happened again when Take the front uh, of the car. Yeah, yeah, you got a light. Yep. So like his, you know, he was like, "You got a, what a light." Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the lady was like, Ooh, "Like she was screaming," but it was like two octaves or an octave lower. Totally. That's the thing that I that really kind of fucked me up because like I just all I was thinking about was like this doesn't sound right. It doesn't look right. I don't know what's going on. Right. And it was like that scene. The sound with the like, I kept calling like referring to that as like the Night of the Living Dead scene because mm-hmm. it kind of felt like that because it was like the old timey black and white kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Fucking freaky, man! Like I don't know, I don't want to say it's scary because then people watch and say oh, it's not scary. It's, it's fucking, absolutely scary. It's very fucking. But freaky. I'll talk about why it's actually scary. But then they're wrong. But the th- the thing is, like, I you if you watch the the last fifteen minutes of the show are my favorite, and if you watch the last fifteen minutes, not if you listen to the last fifteen minutes of the show, don't watch it. Listen to it, right? Mm-hmm. The crunching of the heads. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and the scraping of the footsteps and like the fluttering of the wings of like the frog bug and like whatever. These they were so distinct. Like I I don't even know how it's mixed for those effects to be so like ama- like like striking. But especially when he was crunching their heads. Oh, it was really weird. Yeah, and even the little things that he does, like when he grabs the microphone and flips the switch and all that stuff, like. The, the sounds really popped you know i don't mm-hmm. know i don't know how he's really achieving that but it's it's the scariest sounding shit i've ever heard on tv matched up with the visual it like puts you there like it puts you totally. into those that shoes which which, which really you know heightens the the freakiness totally and that's the thing is like that's one of the things that i want to talk about the, the scary part of it is let's just get this out of the way okay there's all kinds of things that scare people don't scare other people mm-hmm. like whatever like just saying oh it's not scary for you is not an interesting argument yeah right? that's not like you know heights are scary as shit for me and i have friends who go up there and take selfies on you know bridge mm-hmm. bridges it's not scary for them like okay big deal that means are bridges scary who knows right there's yeah. no answer for right? <laughs> no they are right exactly <laughs> another heights fan so but but Forget the dumb argument, the, mm-hmm. the the actual argument about what it's scary. First of all, this show, there's a sub-phenomenon happening on the internet of people sharing how episode eight scared the shit out of their pets. I've never, I've never yeah, had yeah. this, I've never seen this phenomenon before. I've seen movies scare pets. You see mm-hmm. a YouTube video and it's like, you know, a bulldog watching Hellraiser or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. But, but this in mass scared 
thousands of pets across the country all at once, which is just the weird that that would happen, right? But forget how it was scaring the shit out of your cat or your dog. Like, the thing is, one of the things that Lynch is doing is, in my mind, he's um, forcing you to be disoriented. Because yeah. he's setting you up. Once you're disoriented, then he's trying to scare you. And what's really interesting to me is one of the things that I really like about horror is the fact that it's brave enough to leave like some unanswered questions. Right? Mm-hmm. There's no unanswered questions in an Adam Sandler movie. You get everything when, you need. <laughs> when you walk out of it, you know what you saw, you know what you liked, you know what you did. There's no, this doesn't linger. There's no unanswered question. Like one of my favorite things, uh, horror experience is watching the Evil Dead for the first time and that last camera rush, the shot where it's flying through the woods and oh, yeah, heading yeah, yeah. towards the cabin, right? And I remember when it was over, I just had all these questions. I'm like, what, what was that exactly? What did it look like? What did it do to him? Mm-hmm. How many times have they done this to people before the cabin? Who's going to get it next? Like there's just these questions that like, can it get me? <laughs> yeah. You know, you have these questions, right? So if you look at the last 15 minutes, which are the scariest parts of the show, there's, there's these questions that are really weird. The God of light guy lets the car escape from him, even though he clearly did not have to, mm-hmm. right? He clearly all could have reached out and crushed the guy's head right there. Once he touches you, you're paralyzed, right? Apparently. Right. Or but you listen to him. Right, 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 right. So he let the guy, he let the car go. Right. Then, then he invades the radio station. He kills the woman instantly. Yeah, yeah. And then he goes in to do his broadcast, and he holds the guy through the whole broadcast. Doesn't crush his head. Just holds him paralyzed while he does his entire message. Why? Like, if they, imagine you. Imagine you were doing the home invasion version of what he did, like in a in a in a in a radio station, right? You shoot the first person and the second person you hold a gun on and then you do a whole broadcast and then you kill them after you're done. That makes no sense. No. Right? So why? Why is it in that order? You know, the only thing I can think of is is that there was a time pressure element to get the message out and it was going to take time to kill the guy and he knew he was so powerful he had him paralyzed and he was just going to do it. Yeah, don't worry about it. So who knows? But who knows if that's even the answer, right? And then the next question is like, why does that message put people to sleep? Yeah, everyone just like... <laughs> Like the one per or two people like collapsed, and then the mm-hmm. other girl sort of like the mechanic gently. goes down, the waitress, and the yeah, she she falls, but then the girl she sort of like falls asleep, yeah, she, she doesn't like, collapse, yeah, right, oh, no, right, another, right, exactly. And then to me, one of the most interesting things is if you if you think about David Lynch is, is aware, not only is he consciously doing what he's doing, but he's aware of the complaints about what he's doing, mm-hmm. and when you think about how challenging it would be, imagine imagine you're too young to even participate in this thought experiment, but imagine something you did 25 years ago, right? I, I was one. Ima- <laughs> All right. Imagine you did something 25 years ago in a talent show, right? Mm-hmm. And then imagine someone comes up to you and says, I'm going to pay you a bunch of money. I want you to do it again. Do it exactly like you did it. You're like, I don't even remember what the fuck I did. What I was saying, like, what this show's 25 years old. They came in with a pile of money and they're like, we want you to do this again, right? There's all this pressure around, like, whatever. But one of the things that people complain about, about David Lynch, is that it's repetitive. Mm-hmm. Why am I watching a guy sweep a floor for three minutes? Oh, my God, that was... <laughs> Why am I watching an entire Nine Inch Nails performance, yeah. right? Why am I watching uh, an old guy who head towards the stairs and then I have to watch him walk up the whole stairs? Why... Why am I watching these things go slow? Why is the pacing off? And and why are you doing this? And the interesting thing is, the complaint is that you say you do things that are slow and they re, they repeat. Mm-hmm. People the, the, they say the same things over and over again. So he literally baked it into the show. The guy keeps saying the same message over and over on the radio, and everybody falls asleep. That is the complaint about David Lynch. Oh, uh, gotcha. Right. And then he's killing people while he's doing it. And something really dark and unfortunate happens when the frog bug crawls inside the girl's mouth, which happens when she lets her guard down. And basically, I'm not saying this is what, saying anything is something what it means in Twin Peaks to return is a mistake. So I'm not saying this is what it means. But I'm telling you as a practical matter of what you saw on the screen, you saw someone who, instead of skipping ahead or trying to look on Twitter and see how to explain it or whatever, was listening to the platters and then listening to a repetitive message that lulled her into sleep and then something dark and bad happened and went inside of her. Mm -hmm. If you do what she does, this show is going to crawl inside of you. (laughs) 
if you take your time with it, if you listen to the messages, if you don't skip, if you don't kill yourself trying to recap, read the recaps, whatever, if you literally do what the characters on the screen are doing, something really dark and interesting is going to crawl up inside you and you're not going to be able to forget it. it. The show is literally telling you that. Maybe not telling you, showing you that, right? So that I think that's another thing that horror, the horror genre is particularly good at, is the horror genre is good at not only unsettling you, but disorienting you. Like, why, why are these questions unanswered? And why am I here? And why did it cut to that? And like, what, what, like that's, it's just like the Evil Dead thing. When this show was over, I had so many questions. Yeah. And, and I mean, you can, you can enjoy all kinds of other things in life, right? Like you, it's totally fine. Like there are no unanswered questions after watching American Idol. There's, there's you know no, exactly who's the winner. There's, there's no unanswered questions about like, except for how did this get made and why am I watching it? Maybe a couple questions, but, but there's no unanswered question about whatever. But things that try interesting things that that touch on scary themes usually leave unanswered questions. And this show is going to have more unanswered questions when it's over than anything that's ever been on TV, which is what the horror genre should do. Is he taking it too far? Maybe. What I like about it though is it's unanswered questions. But not in the sense of like bad storytelling where like they don't answer it because they don't know the answer. Right. Which is what I get frustrated with in some horror films. Mm -hmm. They try to be, they do like that bullshit, like film school, like ambiguous ending type shit. Sure. Where it's like, no, you're just a bad writer. (laughs) You don't know, you didn't, you didn't know what the fuck you were even going with there. Right. But like the way they do it here is it, it does keep you loop. It does keep you in, it does keep you interested in what you think's going. And the thing that I like about it is because um like you're you you're like a like a big Lynch fan like mm-hmm. I would I would even say you're a fanboy like you would mm-hmm. you would probably go to war for him mm-hmm. um I'm new to the mm-hmm. whole thing so I didn't experience Twin Peaks right. so this is like my first run with with the shit and I don't want to sound like some fucking hippie like <laughs> Twin Peaks is an experience <laughs> man like I don't know how else how else to fucking describe it but like that's what. <laughs> at least episode eight was it was like a horror film experience like if somehow they could do that shit in vr like holy shit like you'd be right you'd be set but i was even trying to get alex to watch it and she was she was busy doing something and and you know i i was trying to get her to watch it at the wrong time because she was on her phone trying to do some business stuff and um and she was like you just want me to watch it so you could i could you could or uh i can suffer with you <laughs> and then i was like i was like well it's not really suffering because I enjoy it, but it kind of was, and I still kind of enjoyed it. Right. So I thought that right. was really kind of strange. Like it was like it was sort of painfully long to watch. Totally. But I didn't, I didn't hate it. I like I enjoyed See, that, that moment. Yeah, that's. I want to ask you about that because that's such a great point. Because that was the other thing that I was puzzling over. I watched the whole Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> right. You sat through the whole thing without skipping, which is laudable. I suspect a lot of people fast forwarded through, but I. The thing is that I, you know, there are horror movies where if you tried to explain to an alien species why that was entertaining, I think it would be difficult to explain to us. Imagine an alien who doesn't know anything about whatever, and you're like, so I watched The Last House on the Left, right? So then there was all this screaming, and then there's all this shit I want to talk about right now, and then the whole bunch of people get stabbed, and then, like, and then, you know, it's over. I'm like, and then the alien's like, oh, my God, who did that to you? Why did they make you watch that? You're like, no, I want to watch it. It was entertaining. Yeah. It was entertaining. Why is it entertaining? The only thing I can think of, because the only other David Lynch thing that I've like absorbed was mm-hmm. I listened, because he narrates it. And anytime the author narrates something for an mm-hmm. audiobook, I like it 10 times more. Uh, for his book, Catching a Big Fish, he talks, it's, it's all about transcendental meditation. Mm-hmm. And... The only thing I can think of is that scene where like all the colors were flashing Mm -hmm. sort of felt like a form of meditation. Totally. Because it was long enough to like get you like to sort of like blankly stare at the screen while hearing Mm -hmm. that scary fucking music in the background. So for me, it was almost like it's like a horror version of meditation is how I would describe that scene. Well, yeah, there's actually something he's doing that's that I think is interesting uh, in relation to the horror genre but before we jump to that the 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 point is you think about i can see why there are people who are like this is not entertaining like i'm frustrated with it i give up like whatever and and that's the thing is 
you know, you, going to people in other genres, going to, to people who make, you know, big blockbuster, like, um, you know, epic movies or like whatever, it, it, comedies are entertaining, it, action is entertaining, fantasy adventure is entertaining, right? But horror is the genre that's closest to being on the edge of why is this entertaining? The other ones make you laugh or make you feel like that's me up there. I'm doing this. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm winning battles. I'm, you know, like whatever. But the horror genre can be like two hours of just grim and then everyone dies. And then you walk out of the theater and you're like, wow, that was awesome. Why was that awesome? You know what's funny? Like, you know, like, right? And that's the thing is with Twin Peaks is if anyone should be backing up David Lynch's right to explore the the entertaining versus trying something different it's horror fans that's my only argument right mm -hmm. is that is that he's doing something that's closer to what the horror genre naturally would do than anyone in any other genre right yeah because the non-entertaining charge is put against him all the time and like like alex said i'm oh you want me to suffer with you <laughs> <laughs> right well here's the, the only other thing i wanted to bring up with about david lynch is because i was thinking about like everyone talks about how like artsy fartsy like his stuff mm -hmm. is but we went to that museum in london with mm -hmm. all that weird shit in there mm -hmm. that sort of kind of reminds me of david lynch sure. kind of stuff but to me and no offense to those artists i don't get it like to me that's not my thing like i hated that place <laughs> i didn't like it i thought it was really fucking weird yep. i didn't i didn't get it i think i some i maybe there's a crowd for it i think a lot of it's full of shit but for some reason when David Lynch does like stuff mm -hmm. like that, I feel like it has, I don't know. I'm sure their stuff has meaning, but for me, sure. his feels like it has more meaning. It's more entertaining mm -hmm. and I don't regret, regret. <laughs> right. Right. No, and that's there. a good point because I think the, the, the thing that's coalescing in the community that's against the Twin Peaks return is that it's why am I watching a college student art film? Like yeah. art films don't belong on major American television. Like art films belong in art house movie theaters where weird people can go watch them. Don't make me yeah. like whatever. So first of all, don't watch it. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like if I, like no one made you watch Showtime or whatever. But on, on the, the second thing is I'm glad you said that because that's how I feel about like the fact is that you have someone who is, is the, the whole meaning thing is not the interesting part to him. I don't even think it's that important. Right. But there are people who were like, you know, forget meaning, but they're doing it as a stunt or they're doing it because, you know, it's not, they don't have the talent to learn the rules and then break them. Yeah. David Lynch has learned the rules before he broke them. Mm -hmm. He knows how to make a conventional movie. And that's the thing is like, one of the, one of the things about my argument about giving zero fucks, one of my favorite David Lynch stories is that, um, he was offered to, to direct a Star Wars film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, he gave up on doing it because when George Lucas started explaining his thoughts behind Star Wars in a meeting they had, he started getting a bad headache. And he was, like, annoyed. David Lynch was like, I'm getting this headache and, like, whatever. And he's like, the more George Lucas talked, the more headache he got. So he, he was like, I can't do this. And he left. And he, like, went home. That's a $20 million headache. Yes. <laughs> right? Like, he turned out a project because he got a headache trying to... He turned out Star Wars. <laughs> that's, that's what, that's what, Not a project. That's he a, turned right, out Star that, Wars. Right. That's a zero fucks mentality, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. But, but that's the thing is, like, I think... He the the reason he got offered is that he could have made it. Yeah, right. You got to learn the rules before you break them, and mm -hmm. I think that's what you're sensing about why there's something underneath there that's entertaining and storytelling, and it's not just fucking around. Like mm -hmm. there's there's a purpose behind it. Right? Um, and then the thing that I wanted to like the what in terms of what his relationship to the horror genre like to me, there's this really interesting um, uh, way that he's developing the fact that the the we had talked about this in a previous episode actually about how fighting bad things takes a lot out of you mm -hmm. right so i know there's a lot of people who are super annoyed by like the the giant who i think is now called the fireman i think that leaked um and um how slow they move and how like the all that stuff is whatever but these are the, the idea behind these these beings are that they're super ancient people who have been doing this job for a long time. The bad people get to eat all the suffering and the garbage garbage and they get to 
to stay Garvin Bosey. What what is that? I see. It's, I was looking at the the. the Twin Peaks. It's one of the very few things that David Lynch explicitly gave away because there's a subtitle when they say Garmin Bosia in, I think, Fire Walk With Me, and in the subtitle says Pain and Suffering. So they, 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 they exist off Pain and Suffering, and that's the interesting part. So, so all right, so, so let's focus on this for a second. The idea is the atomic bomb goes off at the Trinity test. Mm-hmm. And it sets off an alarm where the giant is, where the fireman is. And and there's a fire that goes off. And then he has to put the fire out somehow by sending someone good. So he sends Laura Palmer, right? which is what we know so far, right? I just want to confirm. Yes. I knew he, that was that was Lurch from the Alice family. I had to confirm <laughs> it. Okay, so, sorry. So that's fine. So, so the thing is that the atomic bomb goes off and it's a signal to the, the demons, to Bob, to the woodsmen, to the like whatever, in some way that earth has achieved a ability to cause pain on such a massive scale that it's worth it to be here right because if you if you're bob and you eat people's pain and suffering and you're on earth in like the caveman times like you're eating like you know 10 caveman a day or whatever yeah, yeah. we can kill millions of people in a second now mm-hmm. that is like gourmet suffering <laughs> right all you can eat <laughs> so all you can eat they, right, right. I mean, the possibilities are almost limitless for suffering now we've gotten that far right mm-hmm. so the atomic bomb goes off and one of the things that i love about the horror genre is in a in a large sense disaster porn right yeah the horror genre loves disasters loves wiping out towns wiping out populations like i'm wiping out communities like whatever and every time we see an atomic bomb go off in, in a horror movie or any other kind of movie, like whatever, what happens is the blast radius goes out mm-hmm. and destroys all the buildings. And inevitably, like the, the most famous one I can think of, the one that pops in my head, is T2, right? Where she has the dream sequence and the whole world's getting oh, yeah. And, and the blast radius goes out and destroys everything. And the camera always follows it. It always goes tracks along it. Like, look, it's knocking down this building, this building, mm-hmm. and this building, and this going. Like, Roland Emmerich's made a whole career out of this shit, right? So, like, everyone, every camera is like the blast radius goes, and then they follow it out. Like, yeah, David Lynch is like, yeah, why don't we go in? Yeah, like, well, I'm not gonna follow it out. What's happening in there, <laughs> right? Like, that's just a brave move. I can't believe it hasn't happened before. To tell you the truth, like the the important thing is what's happening in there. Mm-hmm. The peripheral thing is what's happening out here. Right? The Trinity test literally killed a bunch of animals, horrible, and then you know knocked down some fake shit that they erected. The scientists who did it like didn't even. I mean, they just heard a blast and a flash for a second. Nothing happened to them, right? The Trinity test meant that a whole millions of people were gonna die and it was gonna be horrible, whatever. But the test itself meant zero outside of it. Mm-hmm. No consequences. The consequences are inside of it. Which is where he went. <laughs> Which was like the coolest, like eight to ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, totally. It was, but it's just brave, right? That's the thing, and that's another thing that the horror genre should be. Well, the song choice brave. with that scene too perfectly sums up like a nuclear explosion. Totally, like it's just fucking terror. Like totally, that song alone. Like you, we had, we did an episode on horror music, mm-hmm. and you played something similar to that. Yeah, before what was that? It was you, from Chronos Quartet. It's called Black Angels. Black it's, Angels. Yeah. And it, it remi- that was it, that popped into my head. Yeah, I, I, it's I, very I, similar, and because it, it's just it's just so fuck it's just, it's so fuck you. Yep. Like, how do you write that piece? <laughs> right, and well, and and not only that, but he when you think about it, he taped that piece of music to a full on nine inch nails performance. Mm-hmm. Like, literally, he had to sit down and be like, you. Know, he, I mean, I don't even know if he thinks about it because if you thought about it, you'd you'd have to like second guess it like here's what i want the the people who watch this to experience a dark nine inch nail song and then this in a row yeah like there's nothing like (laughs) there's that one moment where cooper wakes up like that's like a 10 second break right then it just goes right to the yeah i mean that's just it's just a relentless and like whatever and i get it i get why people why would it annoy people or why they would check out or whatever Uh, and that's totally fine totally you're right the, the arguments I'm making are, there, are that when you think about it, you pay attention to it, there are things happening in the the return and what, what not just Lynch, but the amazing cast and all the people that are working on it, all this, the cinematographer is an amazing, a guy named Peter Deming, 
um, and and all uh, the, all the people who are contributing to it, they're doing stuff that that people in the horror genre should be best equipped to get it, understand it, and back it up just on principle, mm -hmm. even if you don't like it. <laughs> well, I liked it. I liked it. It was it was groovy, man. Like that's the only way. I just I just liked it. In fact, I, after I was done watching it, I was on like there's a, one of the subreddits where they just post like creepy pictures. Somehow I landed mm -hmm. on that, and I had watched it around like oh I forget what time. But anyways, the sun had went down, and then I was watching it in here, and then it was dark, and I I, I found myself for a split second being like, what the fuck are you doing? Get up and turn the lights on. Like stop. <laughs> But like for that for for that moment, I I sat there and like right. that. Then I understood what all those articles were about, where they're like, "That was fucking freaky." Because it's not freaky when you watch it; it's right. freaky when it's over. What, well, yeah, I, I totally, I, yeah, I totally agree. I think the the after effect to me was more unsettling than than the actual thing. And there was an interesting review from reviewer. They did a roundtable discussion from I think GQ magazine. Mm -hmm. And they were watching it, obviously, simultaneously. And they obviously know each other. It was like four of their reviewers, you know. And the one guy was like, right at the end as the show was, was you know, ending, he was like, not only was I, he was like, not only was I scared, but I called you, he's talking about the other reviewer, to make sure you are right. Because I felt like something was really wrong. <laughs> something was wrong with the world, you know. The fact that the show can just be like, not only is it creeping you out in the time, but after it's done, you're like, wait, is something something wrong? <laughs> yeah, I got to make sure my people are okay. Like, you know, like... it does. I mean, it really does something to you after after you sit and think about it for a minute. Sure. Like, it's not one of those things, like, as you're watching... I mean, I'm sure some people can watch it as it's happening and be like, yeah, I get it, what's going on. But for me, it was like, I, you know, I had to, like, you know, let it simmer for a little bit. Totally. And then, like, walk around. And then I was even thinking about it just walking over to our friend's house just around the block. I mm -hmm. was like... Thinking about that one scene, and all it is is just scary music and colors and explosions. And I'm like, you know, it's not like a scene in Drive that I love, where sure. I'm like, yeah, Ryan Gosling gets away or beats a guy down an elevator. I'm thinking about just like what's going on inside a nuclear explosion. But it's also, yeah, correct. But it's also, it's also the sum total of what you just got presented versus what happens to you every day and what you're expecting. I mean, yeah, you turn on a show on Showtime. And you know, I'm about to watch this for an hour. And what you get is a show with less than 50 words of dialogue that's one third in black and white. Mm -hmm. Like you're not really thinking about it while you're watching it. But afterwards, your brain is telling you, wait, what? <laughs> wait. If you describe the details of what you're about to get to someone, right. half the people, people would be like, no. That makes you. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, there are a lot of people who are saying, I don't want that. But that's. So anyway, that's the thing is. You know, we, there's a there's a weak pause. Uh, everyone gets to like wonder what's coming next. I did so. I was trying to find some like doing some digging around online mm. just to like to, to bring more to like you're you're the Twin Peaks expert, but I wanted to try. I wanted to up my game. I wanted to see like what can I find out online. Sure. Uh, short answer is nothing. <laughs> but one thing I saw was, and I and I'm sure you can shut this down. I'm sure it may have zero correlation, but someone mentioned that. The two people, like where the bug, or the frog thing goes in the mouth. Mm -hmm. so, so one of the the guy and the girl, some relation to Possible Cooper. Possible Sarah Palmer. Oh yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of speculation. Yeah, so, speculation that it's Sarah Palmer and Leland. Speculation that it's who would be Laura Palmer's parents. Speculation that it's Cooper's parents. Speculation that it's Bob parents. I mean, there's all kinds of speculation about who it is. And that's the thing is the the the, you know. <laughs> This is going to sound ridiculous, but being Lynch... On a Twin Peaks episode, I think you're fine. No, no. This is going to sound literally ridiculous because it's an actual quote. But, but you know, it, it's so funny with Lynch, you just can't... You can't tell whether he's being serious or not, right? So, like, the I remember the promo heading into the launch of The Return. They had this great promo, and then as, as it ended, it was a, a shot of Lynch, and he was like... Um, Pay attention to the donut, not the hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right? And then I just laugh because like, fuck you. Like that, that's meaningless. That means yeah. nothing, right? But maybe it means something because like the, that couple could be three, three versions of couples we already know. It could be people we haven't met. It could be anyone, right? Yeah. But the interesting thing is 
that Twin Peaks is the only show I've experienced in the la- in the advent of Google in the last three or four years where I couldn't just find out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right? That's the amazing thing about this is that we don't know. <laughs> like, right? We don't know who this is. So the, 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 the amazing thing is that what the donut is, what actually is there, which is you just watched people have... And their conversation was weird, by the way. The co- the, yeah. the the guy and the girl, they were talking like robots or something. They were super emotionless, right? And he was like, you know, can I can I kiss you? She's like, yes. She's like, she was like, you know, you're new in town. He's like, yes. She's like, how'd you know that? She's like, I know. Like it was yeah, it's it was... a nonsense conversation, right? Mm-hmm. So they're talking to like <laughs> weirdos, right? So like, you've got people in front of you who don't know what they are. You don't know you don't know who they are. You don't know what they represent, and you don't know why they're talking the way they are. But what just happened was you watched people you don't know do that, and you feel like something significant just happened. Mm-hmm. Like it means something, but you don't know what it means. Yeah, we have no that's, idea. That's the thing, right? That's the so you know, there's no way to shoot it down because no one knows. Like that's there's no like, I mean, a few people know who worked on the project, but apparently they're not. Apparently, Lynch killed them all, or gave them bags of money, or something. Because no one will have no clue. No one's leaking anything. (laughs) But the the part that sucks is like I don't even like you know the next you know the next episode that could air more than likely gonna have nothing to do with what we just saw. (laughs) It's just gonna go into something else. Well, yeah, but so that's I think the thing that is in you know one of the things that's interesting about I know it's semantics, but the. I, you notice that Lynch is calling it parts, not episodes. Yeah. He didn't want the episode name. And he said that he saw it as an 18-hour movie. Now, the idea of an 18-hour movie terrifies me because I don't think I could sit through 18 hours of anything, even if it was good. <laughs> like straight. Do you think row. they'll cut it as an 18-hour movie? I'm sure it's going to get released as an 18-hour thing at some point because I'm sure there's some masochists out there who will watch it hour later. But uh, that's the, I think that, that the, the next part may not have anything to do with this but if you sat down and watched it as an 18 hour thing and absorbed it i think it's all going to interconnect and have a big i mean the weird thing about lynch is for most times um you think it's really complicated i saw someone who did like a breakdown of mulholland drive and their elevator you know explanation of it is like literally five sentences I mean, there's not a lot. They break it down. That, yeah, it doesn't take yeah. a lot to explain what's actually happening. You know what I mean? So, yeah. like, I think when this is over, it's going to be a lot simpler than it seems if you watched it all in a thing. But it's getting gotcha. doled out to us week after week. So is the next hour going to relate to this hour? Who knows? <laughs> Probably not, like, whatever. But the hour after that is going to relate to, you know what I mean? The, yeah. the further, the more of it we get, the more the uh, strands are going to uh, connect so well we're gonna see only time will tell that's right unless a nuclear explosion goes off <laughs> and we find ourselves in the middle of the explosion and then all of a sudden we're in the 1940s given the news this morning i think the odds of that are well we'll, we'll be wrestled into <laughs> into into a nuclear nuclear yeah. explosion and and just to I, I guess to we'll end with how the the episode or the last episode ends nothing People have been looking up what the uh, I am the water, I am the well. Mm-hmm. This is the water. This, this is the water, water as well. Yeah. What the fuck's that? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there's that weird subreddit where people found it on that website. I don't even know if that's actually been fully explained. Maybe it's someone who worked on the project who leaked it or, or something. But um, that scene was interesting in the fact that the the woodsman did he did two interesting things with his body language during that he said this is the water and then when he said this is the well he looked down at the guy he was killing and it two times that he said this is the water he said this is the water and and then when he said this is the well he looked at the guy right so you know the bug ends up crawling inside someone which is you can you can go into a well right so if if he if it's kind of like the 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 well is where we keep the suffering mm-hmm. right this is where the suffering comes from and the fact that he was directly looking at the dude that he was torturing while he was saying this is the well was interesting to me might not mean anything but um it was weird that that body language was there like that so i don't know you know if that's going to bear out later 
but it's 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 you're right when you look up something you should be able to find it like any other filmmaker like like um you know if you're watching like uh, that movie we love the faculty robert rodriguez or whatever or any horror movie if or if someone's quoting a poem it's just a poem Mm -hmm. it's yates or robert frost or they're quoting someone who's a poem and you google it you're like oh you know that's the poem <laughs> like they don't... done done right you google this and you're like <laughs> what <laughs> <laughs> which is which is honestly part of the magic of it to me so and and, I mean, and the more he said the more i was like okay then <laughs> water well drink water well yeah drink. And, and also also really weird side note there have been crucial times where showtime's closed caption is just wrong mm-hmm which is really interesting to me that that it's 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 wrong and they actually one of the producers had to come out and clarify it. So like in a in a previous episode, the guy runs into the diner that scene the episode. Oh yeah, 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 at the end. And yeah. he goes, um, he goes, where has anyone seen Billy? And and the subtitle says, has anyone seen Bing? And they had to clarify to be like the subtitles are wrong. And then this one, when you Google it, the website where you found it. He's using the word ascend, but the subtitles are saying the word descend, right? So, like, the subtitles have been wrong multiple times. I don't know how that happens. Is that on purpose or just a... I, I don't think it's it. on purpose. I think that it's a showtime thing, right? So, I yeah, I have no Out of all the shows to make little errors <laughs> on. <laughs> yeah, with his attention to detail. Making sure a, it's make it a mountain out of a mole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the fans are, like, waiting to, like... Figure out what the hell is happening. Right? Jump right on top of that shit. Well, I'm all right, well, this is the week that it's not on. So glad. hopefully, this was a good fix for you. Something to something to chew on until next week. Absolutely. In the mm-hmm. meantime, at least here in the states, go go grill this weekend. <laughs> exactly. Talk talk about it over with your friends. Try to get to the bottom of the well. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Talking Figure out what's down the there. And uh, <laughs> uh, until next time, stay scary. And if you like this show and you want to support us, go on over to our Patreon page where you'll get some more exclusive episodes. Like coming up, we have uh, our review of War of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, so excited! I have a feeling I know who wins. <laughs> I could be wrong, but if you want to, if you want to find out uh, beforehand, uh, check us out on our Patreon. Until then, stay scary. Bye guys. Bye guys. Bye guys.